Well, hello, Grace Fellowship and all of our friends. I am excited that tomorrow morning, Sunday, we are going to go and have a gathering. We're going to have our worship service on the front lawn of the grounds of the Great Grace Fellowship Church grounds. But we know that a lot of our church family and friends will not be able to attend uh, still because of health issues and, the, um, and and simple inability to get there. But, so I wanted to preview the message that I'm going to give tomorrow morning here on uh, our online service so that you know, those can hear it either tomorrow or later on this evening. Now this will be the first gathering since this COVID-19 coronavirus uh, pandemic, but better called a lockdown, happened uh, since March of March 15th. And and one of the things that concerns me and burdens me, first of all as a Christian, and second of all as a citizen of the United States of America is the response and the authority that the government has taken upon themselves to dictate to the American people uh, how they are to take care of themselves health-wise. And, and, and I've shared and, and, and given you uh, other views and uh, from a citizen's point of view, my concerns of how local governments and state governments have been responding. Uh, I'm thankful for our president and what he has tried to do, and I am anxious for this lockdown and this quarantine, which goes against all president of, of health. When someone gets sick with uh, uh, a disease, you quarantine that person. You don't quarantine the whole population. Uh, there is no way that you'll be able to protect yourself um, from disease uh, by simply locking yourself up in your home. But one of the concerns was is that they dictated to us that God's people could not gather and worship the Lord, which is a direct, and that's one thing to do that temporarily, but we, we have some uh, leaders advocating that this would go on until uh, a vaccine is developed for this coronavirus. And of course, vaccine doesn't necessarily mean that it, it's like a polio vaccine where that it cures the disease. Um, and we have no vaccine that cures a flu. The, the, the general flu vaccine that you get is not a cure for the flu. Supposedly it helps you not to get it, but some people do get it after they take the vaccine. But Never mind that. The, my point here is, is that God's people are mandated in Hebrews chapter 10, where it says, now, and, and we're, we're talking about the last days. And you have heard my perspective now, that much of how the government is responding and um, how there has been overwhelming submission to the dictates and authority of a government, whether or not they're corrupt or whether or not they think that we're, they're fair or whether or not we think that they're being um, sensible. Overwhelmingly, there has been uh, total submission to what they have had to say. Um, and so it is, it is a, one, a, a tremendous illustration of, the, of a simulation of what it will be when the Antichrist takes over, and especially during those seven years of Jacob's trouble, what is called the tribulation. Now, the last days began at the resurrection. When Jesus Christ ascended into heaven, that was the last days. And throughout the New Testament, the apostles were preaching and teaching the imminent return of Jesus Christ. He said, I'm going to come back. And that's a promise. And we can believe that because of all the other promises that have been fulfilled uh, that the prophets have shared with us 
and that God himself has shared with us. And so, you know, 20 years, Paul was, was preaching and teaching in, in the, the book of Romans and, and other books. And they were talking about the imminent return of the Lord. So we are in the last days, even though it's been 2,000 years. Now, there are some specific issues that makes it more imminent. Of course, we're definitely closer to the second coming of the Lord because it's been 2,000 years since he said he was coming back. But Israel has come out of captivity for the second time. Isaiah chapter 11, that wonderful text that talks about, um, uh, you know, a child will sit next to a lion and, and a lamb will sit next to a lion and a snake and so forth and so on. And we'll be able to play with snakes and, concerning the millennial kingdom. And it specifically states there in the 11th verse of chapter 11 that after the second captivity, when Israel comes back after the second captivity, which the second captivity, the first one was Babylon, the second one was uh, Rome and the dispersion that happened after the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. So they've been back. They've been back in there since May, May 14th, I believe it is, was the 72nd year of the return and the statehood of the nation of Israel. Now, since the United Nations declared them to be a, uh, that this land was theirs and they had every right to be a state. But I want you to know, it's kind of, if I was on the platform at Grace Fellowship, it would be like um, we've, I've walked up to the end of the stage, and you know how you get concerned that I'm going to fall off. Well, that's, you know, it's kind of like the end times, and, and, and the timetable right now is like I walked up to the edge, and it's at the end, but now I'm walking alongside the stage, and I could fall over at any time. And that's the timetable we're at now. We're at the end, and we're kind of walking along the edge, waiting at any moment to, to go over. Now, with that concept, we have been told a couple of things. And, and I want to share this morning. I want to be a little bit of a comfort to you, because this has been a, a frustrating time for me. It's been a, 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 a just a, a time of great concern and burden in my in my. Am I doing as a pass to what needs to be done? And, and, and my main focus uh, since this lockdown is, is for you to do, is to cry to the Lord and get yourself strong spiritually, inwardly with your soul, become mighty in soul by being in the word of God. And take advantage of this time of, of having to be alone or quiet or just be with your family in your home, to take a time to have a desert experience like Paul had and Moses had, and I hope that you've had a burning bush uh, experience during this time. But so I want to give you a little comfort. I want to give you what, you know, I'm not getting any satisfaction from people's, um, uh, this elite advice about what they're going to do. We have all these, these uh, experts. But church family, the, the experts are sharing two different things. You've got those who are saying that the mask doesn't help you. In fact, it, it hinders your own breathing and, and, and weakens your immune system. Be locked down. They say, uh, you know, be quarantined. But then there are those experts that say you need to be out to develop your antibodies and, and your immune, in your immune system. And so, you know, we're going back and forth. So what we need, we, we need a word from the Lord, don't we? We need a word from the Lord. That's what we need. And of course, our people who, who we have put in places of leadership need the wisdom of God. Because you've got so many preferences and feelings. And as you know, we live in a, a post-truth time that that's how people make their decisions upon their preferences and their feelings. So I need a word from the Lord. So I, and one of the reasons, and one of the things that we need to be doing during difficult times is gathering together. When we're in a battle, when we're in a trial, we're to gather together. That's, that's the story of 2 Chronicles 20. I, I've preached that sermon over and over again at Jehoshaphat. You know, he, let me just, just go over there in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Jehoshaphat the king. He, he's got the people of Moab and the people of uh, Ammon and the 
uh, are come to battle against Jehoshaphat. Now, Jehoshaphat's fears. It's been a fearful time, hasn't it? People lost their job. The economy has gone down. 34 million are unemployed. They're printing money like it's monopoly money. And they're putting a debt over us that we're, we're just a house of cards ready to fall apart at any time. There's great fear. Well, Jehoshaphat had great fear. He had a great multitude coming against him from beyond the sea. And so he set himself to seek the Lord. That's what you do. We need a word from God, don't we? So he sick and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. We're going to get together. We're going to get serious with the Lord. And so Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord. Now, do you realize that there has been, most of the time, when you look at the history of America, when we're going through a pandemic, when we're going through war, it was a constant thing from the President of the United States would call God's would call America to prayer, and even fasting in prayer through every war. Now, but you don't hear that too often today. And so Judah gathered to seek the Lord. And Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah. I'm reading from 2 Chronicles 20. In the house of the Lord before the new court. And he gives a wonderful prayer. He remind, reminds the Lord. He, he speaks God's word back to him. That's what you do in prayer. That's why you need to be in the word of God. Are you not our God, verse 7, who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel? And gave it to the descendants of Abraham, and you said that we, you will be our friend forever. And so he calls upon the Lord. He says, if disaster comes, we can call upon you. And so God speaks to him, and he says to him in verse 15, listen to this. And he said, listen, all of you of Judah, and all you inhabitants of Jerusalem, and all you, and you, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid, nor dismayed, because of the great multitude that's coming against you. For the battle is not yours, but God's. You will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves, take your position, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. Who is with you? O oh, Judah and Jerusalem, do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow, go against them, for the Lord is with you. Now, I want you to notice, once again, how did he, how did he tell them, how do I want you to go, go against them? I want you to strategize about how you're going to move your tanks, or you're going to strategize how many bombs, how many airplanes you're going to fly out. No, this is what he says to them. And when he had consulted with the people, King Jehoshaphat, he appointed those who would sing to the Lord, and who would praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army and were saying, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endures forever. Now when they began to sing and to praise the Lord, the Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who had come against Judah, and they were defeated. In this battle against a totalitarian authority that is coming more and more in, the, in America, I want you to see what you do. First of all, you worship the Lord. That's your service. You go to the Lord in worship and praise. Second, I want you to, you need to be somber about these times and get yourself ready for the Lord's coming because he's going to deliver you. He says, your salvation is nearer than before. And that salvation, remember, the term salvation, like the term chosen, is not used in the same definition. Salvation from the wrath to come is coming soon. And then third, I want you to find where you find and get your satisfaction of what to do and how to think. Service, somberness, and satisfaction. 
Now, service, what, this is what we're to do. What, what are we to do in these last days, Lord? Uh, I need you to talk to me. Well, this is what he says. He speaks in Hebrews chapter 10. And let us get, now hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. He's coming. He's going to deliver you from this mess. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. We need to consider each other. We need to get together. We need to pray for each other. We need to exhort each other. How do you do that? Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as is the manner of some but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. There it is. We're supposed to be gathering. We're supposed to be worshiping together. The Lord's told us to do that, especially in the last days. We're going to need that. Because you see, that shows our trust and faithfulness in the Lord. You see, when, when you win the Super Bowl, what do you do? You have a celebration. You go and you drive down Main Street of your city and the people just holler and cheer. Well, we come together regularly to say to the Lord, he's going to do all that he's going to do. And we trust him and we believe in him. And so we're excited about that. Folks, do you realize, do you realize that we are closer that going into the presence of our Lord today than we were ever before. Just because of time, that's a fact, of course. Now, we as Christians should have some excitement about that. I realize that there are many that don't. And so that should awaken you. That should, maybe you need to get your house in order. Maybe your priorities is wrong. As it's, you know, Matthew, Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah. The people were just getting married and just going about their business. We just living in the details of our life, just working our job, being married, having children, getting our retirement. No focus upon the most important thing in our life. Our walk with the Lord and our witness with the Lord and our salvation and our sanctification process. So here... Jehoshaphat and Hebrews is telling us, do not forsake the assembly. When you got a battle coming at you, and we're going to have battles, we're going to be battling the things of the world from birth until we take our sword and put it in the sheath at death. But when the battle is attacking, turn off the video, turn off the news, and turn your attention to God. Worship, praise, ask for help, pray, be together, and pray together. It's important. Every major revival, and even at Pentecost, what was happening? God's people were gathered together, praying for one another, seeking God, together, corporately. And God rained down with the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. God raised down and wiped out the Ammonites and the Moabites and Mount Seir with Jehoshaphat as they praised the Lord. Got their singers singing, the instruments playing, praising the Lord. Reviewing all that God has done. He said, stand still. Do not fear, but trust in me. You believe me? You, 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 you believe that I, you know, the Lord said, you believe me? what I'm going to do? He says, well, then I want you to show it. How do you show it? In worship, in praise. As I said in the last pastor's update, it's our pledge of allegiance, but it's also our statement that we trust the Lord and we're people of hope and we're, we're people that fear not. We belong to God. He's responsible for us. None of our anxiousness, none of our worry we certainly can't figure out. The, the elites on the press conferences can't figure out. He says, no, man your post where God's put you, serve him, put your armor on, and worship the Lord. And that's why it's important for us to gather together. Focus on what God has done. He's a fantastic God. 
you know, when they're ready, when Israel looked at uh, Pharaoh's army coming down upon them to, to recapture them, and they had the Red Sea uh, in front of them. They had the mountains on both sides of them, and they had Pharaoh's armies coming back. And God told Moses, stand still and see what God will do. And he did it. He opened that, that sea. And, and it's amazing how, when you think about that, when you think about that, he, you know, how, how wide did he have to open that Red Sea to get millions of the Israelites across it? In, in, in one night. <laughs> Some people have said they had to be 5,000 abreast to get those millions of Israelites through the Red Sea. And then when you think about going through the wilderness for 40 years, for all the people that we believe there was, millions of them, a quartermaster from the army predicted that, or set up that you needed 1,500 tons of food each day. 1,500 tons of food each day. Two, that would be two freight trains, um, each one of them a mile long for a day of food. You need four, firewood, 4,000 tons of firewood, and that would take a few more freight trains a mile long. Yet water just for drinking and washing, you would need 11 million gallons. That would be a train of 1,800 miles long. And God did that. You think God can take care of you? Do you really believe it? Do you believe you serve a fantastic God? Do you believe that God knows what's going on? Do you believe that you're in the palm of God's hands? Do you believe well, then praise the Lord and worship him. Show him that you do. So when the thunder beats of the enemy, what do you do? You gather together and worship the Lord. Worship the Lord. How do you defeat Satan? You gather together and worship the Lord. You point to singers. What did Paul and Silas do when they were in jail? Paul turned to Silas. Silas, you know what I feel like doing? Silas said, what do you feel like doing, Paul? I feel like singing. In prison, ready to have his head cut off, felt like singing. That's what we're to do. We're people of hope. We have a destiny that's sure. We have a past that's forgiven. We have a present where we're standing in the palms of God's hands. I love the story of the little daughter who, whose father was the sea captain, and he took her on a on a tour uh, on his cruise ship. It was a sailboat ship big ship and a storm came on and some of the sailors came down and woke her up and said we're in the midst of a terrible storm we don't know where we're, if we're going to make it and she she stirred up and she asked one question she said is my father at the wheel he said yes he is well then everything's okay and she went back to bed I know the storms are up and they're falling, but I want to ask you one question. Is our Father at the wheel? Yes, He is. Well, then worship the Lord and praise Him. Okay, so that's your service to God. And remember, we call, it's not a worship service, it's a service of worship. And that's why we gather together. And we're going to do it. Again, get back doing it again. I want you to pray. Churches in California are bonding together and they're going to gather and worship in their church on May 31st, irregardless of the restrictions of their state governor. I want you to pray for them. And obedience to God is far greater than man's laws that has no sensibility to it whatsoever. Now, secondly, we are to be somber about these times. Absolutely. In Romans 13, and we're going to be getting together on that, but remember Romans 13 um, states, in verse 11, let me read this. And do this, Romans 13, verse 11, and do this knowing the time, knowing the time that now is a high time to awake 
out of your sleep. For now our salvation, that's our deliverance from this world, is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light and let us walk properly as in the day. Not in the way man deals with difficulties, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. One of the legends of jokes and stories at Bible college and seminaries is how many professors dealt with a sleepy student. I had never experienced, but I was always told that when I was a freshman at Philadelphia College of Bible that one of our professors was noticing that one of his students was nodding off. And so he very secretly had all the rest of the students to stand up and go outside the room. And he fetched a trumpet and blew the trumpet. That old student woke up in a frizzy. He looked around. Nobody was there. And he said, oh, no, the rapture has happened. And I didn't go. Now, I've been told that story. I didn't experience it, but I can see that. That would be funny, indeed. But you know, in my day, and of course, in my circles, we believe that the rapture is 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians tells us, and that we are being saved from the wrath to come. That doesn't mean we're not going to have difficulties and we're not going to experience the evilness of our time and that we're not going to be persecuted. And the Christians in Asia and, and other parts of the world, we have been very fortunate. It has been very unusual that we, in this country of for over 250 years, have not suffered the persecution that the rest of the world has. But I believe a part of that is because the foundation of this country was based on Judeo-Christian values. But basically... We all understood, and, and, and part of the preaching of the second coming of the Lord and the rapture was, is that it, it kept us holy, and, and we, were, we were somber about the times, and we were very concerned about our life and our walk with the Lord, because we didn't want to be doing something that was offensive to God and offensive uh, to his principles, and, and, and not doing what he's called us to do if he were to rapture us at that moment. And that's why 1 John says that it is good to be thinking about the coming of the Lord because it keeps you holy. And so we are to be somber about these times. Uh, and we are to be alert. I sometimes think that, you know, the doctors are asking us to, some doctors are asking us to wear masks, but I think they're also asking us to wear blindfolds or not to see what they're doing and to see see what's happening around us and how we are to be responding to us. And so how how somber are we supposed to be? Well, I won't go into in depth, but I'll just say it's Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, which is the aspects of revival. If my people remember that revival begins in the house of the Lord, and so we are to be humble. We are we are to deal with our sin. We're dust, we're sinners, we need God's help. Have you ever it is amazing how how these government leaders and politicians, very few of them ever say, well, you know, I was wrong. I was wrong. I, I don't think that we needed to quarantine everybody. I, I was wrong about the hospitals being filled up. I was wrong. But nobody ever says they're wrong. But if you want God's revival, humble yourself and say, oh, Lord, I need your help. We're to pray. And I mean pray. When Evan Roberts brought, the, brought down God's revival upon the Welch nation, he shares about how he was praying and he had the encounter of a fire living and welling up in his heart at 1 a.m. Just think how long he was praying. John Hyde, missionary to India, 
that tell us that he would pray sometimes six to eight hours a day. I'm talking about prayer. I'm not talking about simply a blessing over a meal. If, you, if my people humble themselves and pray and seek my face, seek his presence, and turn from their wicked ways, sow for yourselves, Hosea says, righteousness, reap in mercy, break up the fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness upon you. And you and I know, as God's people, that our ground has been fallow. It's not been producing much fruit. It's been hardened. How many of us come to the gathering, the assembly of God, hear the preacher, and there's no conviction? There's, no, You know, we just hold home and walk out. I want you to tell you something. That's more of an indictment on you than it is the preacher. If I'm open to the Lord and I come in with humility, seeking God's face in prayer, seeking to turn from my wicked ways, the boringest preacher in the world ought to be able to convict you of something. They ought to say something to you that there's no conviction, no, no sense of anything going on in your soul after hearing God's word and gathering with God's people. Create in me a clean heart, David said. And that's what we are to be doing. And that's part of the gathering aspect. Is to come and search my heart. Therefore, Hebrews 10, verses down further in 35 and 36. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. So be somber, be awakened. Make sure that you put on Christ. Make sure you've got your armor on. You put the belt of truth on your life. And, um, you, you know, and the, and, uh, the breastplates and, and so forth and so on. These are things that we need to be doing. Uh, well, and I'm talking about the armor of God. Let me see. If, um, you know, the, the breastplate, that's confession of sin. Your feet shod, are you a good representative of the gospel? Your shield, are you believing God's going to meet your needs? Your helmet, you have no doubt, you have the mind of Christ, you have his worldview. The sword, the Bible is your guide. And then, of course, the belt, as I first said, uh, that's the, uh, the belt of truth. And we, we look to the truth. We obey the truth in every aspect. We master our emotions. We talk to ourselves. That's what First Peter says in chapter 1. Take up the loins of your mind. Take control of what you're thinking. Is that what you're supposed to be thinking? Full of fear and worry and dismay? No, do not be dismayed. Praise the Lord and trust in Him. Serve the Lord in worship. Be somber. Awaken yourself. Do evaluations. Get close to the Lord, fill yourself up, even mighty in spirit, and then find out, I want to tell you where you find your satisfaction. Matthew chapter 11, very quickly, I want you to listen to this. We're weary. We need comfort. That's why we're gathered together. We've taken this suffering time and this trial time, as every Christian is supposed to do, as a time of evaluation. And to waken us up about the seriousness of our life and the seriousness of the Lord's coming and of the spiritual battles that we're in. But we do get weary and we do just want to kind of fall down and just kind of give up, so to speak. But I want you to take comfort into what Jesus said. In chapter 11 of the Gospel of Matthew, pretty obvious that Israel is rejecting. Their, their Messiah, and he's going to be leaving them and coming to the Gentiles to focus on the gospel to them. And he says this, come to me. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. 
For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Are you weary today? Physically and emotionally, mentally and even spiritually. How do you find rest in your soul? You got the answer right here. You can work your way and try to figure out everything and try to uh, be like the, uh, the religious uh, Jewish people who try to work for God, or you can accept this invitation. It's your choice. It's your choice. Now, I, I, he says heavy labor. We don't know what it is. But I want you to know that you find rest, not in the circumstances, not in your personal possessions, not in the preacher, not in your government, but in Jesus Christ alone. Jesus Christ alone. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes into the Father but by me. He didn't come to say that I'm going to show you the truth. I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm going to model the truth. No, I, I'm not one of the ways. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. The world says, well, what is the way? Jesus says, I am the way. The world says, how can I be sure? Jesus says, I am the truth. The world says, how can I be satisfied? Jesus says, I am the light. Now, he doesn't address here why you're heavy labor, why you're weary. But heavy labor, all those come unto me, he says, all who labor and are heavy laden. So you're really worn out. Something has really overburdened you. You're overloaded. You feel crushed. You ever felt like that lately? It's, you're kind of like climbing up some mountain that's, that's impossible for you to get there and you're carrying some heavy load that's just, just, just driving you down. You can't get up that mountain. He says, come to me. He says, come to me. You know, I, I, my, my blessed wife reminds me that I got to many times quit trying to do things myself. And I, I was moving a pile of wood here this week, and, and, and I, I was so burdened by it. It was heavy, and age has caught up on me, and my back's not as strong as it used to be. And I couldn't get things around. I couldn't get where I needed to put it. It was, it was giving me a hard time. And my grandson came. My oldest grandson came, and he helped me. He helped me. And I learned real quick that you receive the blessing. You receive the real blessings when you don't try to do it yourself. And God says, I want you to come to me. I want you to come to me for strength. I want you to come to me for help. You see, if you walk on Fifth Avenue in New York City, it used to be, I don't know if it's still there, you, there used to be an RCA building there, and it had Atlas with all of his muscles, just, you know, bulging, and he was holding the world. Now, you can try to be an Atlas, or you can walk further down the street on Fifth Avenue in New York City, and you'll come across St. Patrick's Church, and they have a statue of Jesus as a boy, and he's got the world in his hand. Get the world in his hand. You can strain all you want with your life, or you can trust Jesus, who has the whole world in his hands. So I want you to accept the invitation, but I also want you to see very quickly, time's getting away, accept the responsibility. Take a burden by putting on his yoke. Putting on his yoke. That is the nature of true rest. It's not that you don't have any responsibilities. not that you don't have any burdens. But it is joyful submission to the purpose which you were created by God. As I said last week, is a tree free when it's broken away from the ground? Is a train free when it's taken off the tracks? Are you free? Is your soul free when you have nothing to do? You have no responsibility? 
If you're living in rebellion against the Creator who made you, of course not. Take my yoke. Rest is not doing your own thing. Rest is not setting your own lifestyle. Rest is the joyful submission to the purpose which you were created. To have a relationship with the Lord. To fulfill your calling and, and do your spiritual gifts. Learn from me, he said. Put on the yoke is to learn from him. You don't just learn about Jesus Christ. Church family, I want you to know that Jesus is the curriculum. Jesus is the professor. Jesus is the text. Jesus is the subject. Jesus is the, is the whole thing. Discipleship is a lifelong learning school. And you're always learning. I want you to learn of me. You know, when you get in an elevator, many people live their Christian life or try to live their Christian life and looking for a life that's kind of like getting in an elevator. You get in an elevator and you push a button. And it does all the work. You can talk with people and just kind of think about things till you get to the floor. I want you to know the Christian life, God doesn't give you an elevator. He gives you stairs. He gives you stairs. And you got to take the stairs. We don't like the stairs. We like the elevators. Because the stairs requires an effort. You got to do something. You got to put on Jesus. You got to get in the Word. You got to worship the Lord. You got to be a witness. And do what God has told you to do. Take your position, he told Jehoshaphat. You begin, and you know, when you walk in the stairs, you may not be that far up, but praise the Lord, you're not where you used to be. That's where it ought to be with the Christian life. Now, so you begin this rest by embracing your salvation and all of its benefits, but also embrace the Lordship of Christ in your life. You can trust the Lord for the yoke that he's going to allow you to go under, the burden. You know why you can trust him? Because what? Because he's gentle and lowly of heart. Isaiah 42 says, he is a bruised reed. He will not break. That's how gentle he is. That's how gentle he is. You won't go through any burden that you won't be able to get through. He's the only one. Everyone else will disappoint you. Every man's wisdom will disappoint you. But you'll not have a friend like the lowly Jesus. You don't, no, not one. No, not one. There's not a friend so high and holy. There's not a friend so me. No, not one. No, not one. So you can trust him. You can trust his heart. And you can trust this yoke. He says it's easy. And it's good. When a farmer makes a yoke for an oxen, he fits it just right for that oxen. He puts on a well-fitted yoke. And the yoke that God puts on you will be well fitted for you. He says, follow me. I will put a yoke on you. Not a random yoke. But I'll carve it just for you. And so even when you don't understand the burdens that you're going through, trust his heart. Be gentle and lonely. And his yoke is easy. Now, that, that seems like an oxymoron. A, a burden. The burden that I put on you is going to be easy. But well, that's what the Lord says. So trust his burden. Now there's no health and wealth sermon here, is there? You serve God, you're going to have burdens. But don't worry about it. You're going to be all right. He's going to use it for you to be a witness to the Lord, for the Lord. He's going to use it for you to learn how to trust him. He's going to use it to train and disciple you. Well, it's been tough. Let me close. Future's uncertain. Mountains may seem kind of high for you. You've been struggling to figure things out. But, and many of you are kind of like the old fellow that was picked up by the old farmer on the pickup, had a heavy burden on his back, and he gets in the seat and he keeps the burden on. He says, now, fella, you can put that burden in the back of the truck. You don't have to carry that burden because I can carry you and carry that burden. We've given our life to the Lord. We're still carrying our burdens. 
You have a God who feeds the birds. You have a God who clothes the flowers. Many of us have closets full of clothes and we still say we don't have anything to wear. He knows what you're going through. He can take the heavy part. The farmer always puts a strong ox with a weak ox so the strong ox compensates for the weak one. You've got Jesus on the other side of your yoke. Trust and never doubt. Surely he will bring you out. But make sure that he's your Savior through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Make him Lord of your life. Surrender to his favor. Let him increase and you decrease till you can say, not I, but Christ. G. Campbell Morgan said to him, the second coming is the perpetual light on the path which makes the present bearable. He says, I never lay my head on the pillow without thinking that perhaps before morning breaks, the final morning may have dawned. I never begin my work without thinking that he may interrupt my work and begin his own. This is now his word to all believing souls. Till I come, we're not looking for death. We're looking for him. I hope you are. I hope that you're ready. You know Jesus Christ is your Savior. And this time you gain an intimacy. And your faith has been built up in your mighty in spirit. And you are one hopeful, joy-filled Christian. God bless you. See you soon.